Solar flares could take a heavy toll on our wired world. I'm David Gillen for The New York Times. C. Alex Young is a solar physicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. He joins me now via Skype. Hello, Dr. Young. Hello. So look, some experts are wondering about the implications of a big geomagnetic storm, a solar storm, a sun storm, and whether it could knock out telecommunications satellites, scramble GPS signals and so forth. It all sounds a bit 2012 Mayan calendar. How worried should we be? Well, I wouldn't say that we should be worried, but we certainly should pay attention to the sun. Uh, we've been seeing the effects of the sun for uh, hundreds of years and certainly the effects on our technology. So we know that it has an impact and we know that it can be everything from uh, a minor uh, annoyance to beautiful aurora all the way up to power outages. Right. Now, can you explain briefly, what, like we've got sunspots and solar flares. What are they and how are they related? Well, sunspots are regions on the sun where there's very, very strong magnetic field. It's poking through the surface, and sometimes this magnetic field can get twisted, much like a rubber band. If it gets twisted enough, knotted up, it eventually pops, releasing energy. And when that happens, we get a big flash of light. That's what we call a solar flare. But we also, more importantly, get these big blobs of material and magnetic field called coronal mass ejections. And those send billions of tons of solar material, particles, and sometimes they can slam into our Earth, uh, causing interactions with our Earth's magnetic field and creating these geomagnetic storms. Got it. So, you know, we have a lot of trouble sometimes just forecasting the weather here on Earth. I mean, we've got a, uh, a, a, a crest in, uh, in, in some solar activity, I guess, this, this fall. But, I mean, how difficult or easy is it? I mean, can we even predict what's going to happen with the sun? It's extremely difficult. Uh, sometimes I've heard my colleagues liken it to uh, predicting the terrestrial weather well before we had uh, uh, we had satellites in space. Um, fortunately, we do have a lot of new spacecraft that are giving us new views. We have a lot more sophisticated computer models, somewhat like the models that are used to track hurricanes. But we're many, many years behind that. And this phenomenon is, is extremely complicated. But we are you know, able to take measurements. We know basically how much stuff is coming out, how fast it's coming out in what direction, and that allows us to put this information into a computer model and track it, giving us an idea of with it, when it's going to hit the Earth within about seven or eight hours, and what type of uh, storm it's going to cause, and how strong that's going to be. Right. I mean, seven or eight hours, I mean, that's not a, a huge lead time. I mean, you know, if you've got a hurricane coming, you can, you know, you can uh, bag sand and so forth. I mean, what can you do to prepare for, for a solar storm? Well, when these things occur, you know, the solar flare, there's not a whole lot we can do about that that's traveling at the speed of light. So once you see it, it's here. Uh, and that can cause some uh, communication problems. These are things that can be accounted for. Uh, we know if activity is picking up, we can be prepared for the possibility. These big coronal mass ejections can take uh, couple of days down to maybe half a day to reach us. So we do know they're coming. We do have some indication how strong they're going to be. And various types of technology uh, affects, uh, we can take uh, the appropriate measures for various types of technology. So for example, uh, the power grids, the power companies, they monitor space weather and they know that they can make certain adjustments to their power grid networks. Uh, to minimize any effects or, or hopefully just uh, squelch them all together. Got it. Dr. Young, thanks so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. That's all for now. I'm David Gillen for The New York Times.